Hi, it's Dwyer, richarddwyer.com, dwyervip.com. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, if you're like me, you spent last weekend in a room with some friends you might see twice a year, right? And you were there picking uh, fantasy football players. Now, I'm mindful, very mindful of the fact that I'm part of the YouTube boxing channel. We're going to focus on boxing in about a minute, right? But if you're like me and you're involved in fantasy sports, fantasy baseball, which I'm involved with, don't talk about much, but I'm involved with it, fantasy football, if you have your draft this week, if you're looking for platforms where you're going to compete um, against other fantasy enthusiasts, right? If you're into any of the fantasy sports, right? Fantasy football, fantasy baseball, or fantasy basketball. And if you want a deep discount on an industry-leading website, you want to write this down. The promo code is DEWIRE777, that's D-W-Y-E-R-777, at FanDuel.com. The offer, and it's a deep discount, right? I'm sharing the wealth here, applies to new accounts, right? I've been on FanDuel for more than a year. I want you to look into the FanDuel 5-pack offer. I also want you to look into the uh, setup on FanDuel that allows you to go head-to-head -head against other players, as well as the option that allows you to enter into pools with the top 50% winning. At the end of this video, I'll leave tips on how to win at FanDuel and to make it easy for you to jump to those tips in the description section of this video, I will put the start time, right? If it's 10 minutes in, I'll put 10 minutes. If it's 15 minutes in, I'll put 15 minutes that you can click on and just jump to the fantasy portion of this video. All right, let's, uh, let's segue into boxing. You know, in boxing, there's certain figures who you know, are almost mythical. The only reason they're not is because they actually exist, right? You're not an urban myth if you're an urban reality. Now, let me say this. One of the intriguing parts of the Golovkin story is that he ran into such an individual in the finals of the 2004 Olympics, right? Golovkin did not win the gold. He won the silver. The guy who beat him was Gadar Beck, Gadar Bekov, right? From the Soviet Union. Now, understand this guy is a bit legendary. He won the Goodwill Games. He won the European Championship. He beats Hassan Endem on his way to facing Gennady Golovkin. He comes out and loses the first round, right, Olympic scoring, 6-2. to two. Right, 6-2. to two. From there, over the next three rounds against Golovkin, Rather than run away from Golovkin, believe it or not, he wrestles with Golovkin. He's not hiding. He's in front of Golovkin. The two men grab each other a lot. Golovkin's on his front foot. He's not bashful. Right? He has a four-point lead and is only three rounds away from winning the Olympic gold. After the second round, 
when Gadar Bekov starts to come back. Golovkin ends the second round, still up 10-8. 10-8. We get to the third round. Now I'm aware that a lot of people looking to get an edge on the options for this fight, right, are going to focus on that third round. For those of you who want to see the video, I've placed it in my favorites folder here online. Right, Garbekov starts to hit Golovkin and grab him. When Golovkin comes in, Garbekov, who's taller, is able to grab Golovkin around the neck. I'm not kidding. Grabs him around the neck, makes it a grab fest. Won't allow Golovkin to get on track. Is smothering Golovkin. Right? As Golovkin comes in, he'll pivot, he'll hit Golovkin, then he'll grab Golovkin. Golovkin simply cannot handle the grabbing. Because incredibly enough, while Golovkin has a huge punch, he had a huge punch in the amateurs, folks. Look up his record. While he has a huge punch, he doesn't have the core strength. Right? Think torso. He doesn't have the core strength to actually wrestle with his opponent. Right, so the third round, it falls apart for Golovkin. He starts getting hit, he can't get going, he then gets held. The other guy is tying him up on demand. Think Vladimir Klitschko, Alexander Povetkin. By the end of the third round, Golovkin's behind. To the reigning European champion. And of course, we get to the fourth round. Golovkin's desperate, but he's being smothered, right? Golovkin can't even come in and land his first power shot, right? Gadar Bekov moves just enough to, as a guy is charging at him to land shots and then pivot, kind of like Terence Crawford. He ends up with the gold. Golovkin ends up with the silver. So years later, 12 years later, right, that was in 2004. We're now in 2016. Would it surprise you to know that since that fight, Golovkin's been so dominant in fact, Golovkin's been so dominant in his entire career that he's never been knocked down. He wasn't knocked down in this fight. As a professional or as an amateur, right? Think about it. Gadar Bekov, Goodwill Games winner, Olympic gold medalist, never turns pro. Right, this was a different time in athletics. He never turns pro. Right? Now, why it's relevant today is because I've come across pieces just in doing research like everyone else here online where people trying to get an edge are looking at Kell Brook's fight against Sean Porter, where Porter, like Golovkin, in the 2004 Olympic Finals, can't get going, where Porter jumps in and Kell Brook grabs him. Right? That Kell Brook win over Porter had a lot of grabbing. Right? Had Kell Brook tying up Sean Porter a lot. Not allowing him to get going. 
right? The argument is that Kell Brook from this 2004 Olympic final has the blueprint on how to frustrate Golovkin. And the argument goes that Kell Brook has the skills, as he showed in the Porter fight, to execute that game plan. If Kell Brook could tie up Sean Porter time after time after time, and he does a better job of it, quite frankly, than Keith Thurman would later. Right? Keith Thurman's forced to fight. Right? Kell Brook constantly is grabbing Sean Porter's arms. Right? Sean Porter isn't able to get off the runway in that fight. The argument is, why can't he roughhouse Golovkin the same way? Especially since we're hearing that Kell Brook, 30 days before the fight, is in the 170s. Right? You look at Golovkin, you see his weights, he's not a big middleweight. He's not Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. He's not a guy who weighs in the 180s and then miraculously loses 20 pounds to make weight. Right? Golovkin was something like 166 or 165 30 days before this upcoming fight. So if you follow the Kell Brook crowd, the crowd that believes the upset's going to happen. One of the arguments, and to me it's more intriguing than the argument of Kell Brook staying outside and, you know, looking like Ray Leonard against Marvin Hagler, right? Showing us a bevy of hand speed and movement. I don't think that works at all, right? This argument, though, is interesting. Right? This argument is more of a look at the film. Look at the Olympic film. Why can't Cal Brook pull that off? Hasn't he in his first world title fight? Well, let me just say a few things on it. I think Cal Brook loses this fight badly. What do I mean by badly? I mean that I don't see how Cal Brook makes it through this fight without hitting the canvas or being stopped. Right? Let's talk about why Cal Brook can't follow Gadar Bekov's blueprint. Right? First. And I know it's going to sound ridiculous, but in my opinion, fights like the fight that Golovkin had in the Olympic finals really only happened to a fighter once in his career. Right? I'll give you an example. In the Rumble in the Jungle, Ali used the rope a against George Foreman. Right? Who was dominant champ? People need to realize George Foreman destroyed Kenny Norton. Destroyed him. Right? Knocked him out. Right? After destroying Joe Fraser. Right? In the entire 1970s, those are two of the best fighters out there at heavyweight. Foreman destroyed them. Foreman, for whatever reason, fell into the trap Ali set for him, right? As Ali covered up, Foreman kept throwing punches, right? Foreman wasn't thinking in terms of stamina. He saw an older fighter in front of him. He knew that Ali had lost to Ken Norton, right? He, he knew that Ali had lost to Joe Fraser, the very guys Foreman had destroyed, right? So Foreman fought a silly fight. Well, Ali never gave Foreman a rematch. For the rest of Foreman's career, is there any fighter against George Foreman who successfully used rope-a-dope tactics? Right? Older Foreman, when he came back, knew 
to pace himself. He wasn't going to throw himself out. He figured out by his own admission that he could hit Michael Moore early in their championship fight. He chose not to because he said, look, if I hit him with my Sunday punch early in the fight, <coughs> he's going to survive it, right? Because he's resting. Then he'll stay away from me the rest of the match. I want him close to me in the later rounds. Foreman waited until the later rounds to dole out the punishment. In other words, he had learned from his mistake. Now, if you're Golovkin, of all of the fights you've had in your career, and I'm sure he has his hit list of the fights where it meant the most to him. I'm guessing this Olympic final is something he probably remembers every round of. Every round. Right? It was his chance at the gold. And I'm sure looking at the film, he's figured out, look, I was too obvious. I kept diving into the pocket. Right? I, I played into a clincher's game plan. I kept giving this guy an opportunity to clinch me. So just as I don't expect Alexander Povetkin to ever fight the fight he fought against Vladimir Klitschko ever again, where he kept running into clinches, right? I don't expect Golovkin to make that mistake. In fact, in one of the best YouTube videos on boxing here online, Dante's Boxing Nation has a clip of Golovkin talking to his stablemate, Sullivan Barrera. They're in a gym. Abel Sanchez, their trainer, even hops in the video uh, to help the fighters, right? But Golovkin spends that video showing Barrera how to not get clinched inside, right? He, you know, Golovkin comes up, he sticks his head under Barrera's chin, Right? It's a Dante's Boxing Nation video. Right? And Golovkin is showing Barrera how to pivot. Golovkin's acutely aware. He's acutely aware of the fact that Gadar Bekov kept grabbing his neck. Right? He's, he's aware of it. Now he knows not to run deep in the pocket and he knows not to have his head in a position where the other guy can just grab it or tuck it. Right? One of the reasons why the 2004 Olympic gold medalist strategy won't work is because Golovkin himself has learned from that fight. Right? Another reason it won't work, in my opinion, is because Golovkin has added new skills to his portfolio. Right? Look at the 2004 Olympic Finals and ask yourself, where is Golovkin's jab? Right? Golovkin was a guy who was too successful, blowing guys out, way too successful. Now he has a jab. Now, rather than rush in and get clinched, rush in and get hugged, be in a wrestling contest with a wrestler. Now, Golovkin, you saw it in the Lemieux fight against an aggressive opponent who himself thinks he's the power puncher in the fight. Golovkin now has a jab to get you out of the pocket, to allow himself spacing Right? To decrease the urgency caused by another guy rushing at you. You have to get through the jab if you're going to clinch Golovkin. That jab now is an essential part of his game. <coughs> 
it keeps you outside, which is where Golovkin wants you to be. Think about all the Golovkin fights you've seen. You notice Golovkin himself, and he's initiating a lot of the clinching in that 2004 Olympic Finals. Now he doesn't want to clinch you. Revisit that Marco Antonio Rubio fight. You're going to notice Golovkin keeps a distance. Right? Keeps a distance. Then he shortens that distance. Then he's throwing bombs. As the other guy is hurt, you're going to notice that Golovkin doesn't try to grab him. More importantly, you're going to notice that Golovkin, and this is something I've noticed with Sergei Kovalev, doesn't want to get grabbed. Right? Golovkin understands the importance of not being clinched. Now, and his jab gives him a weapon that he didn't seem to have at the 2004 Olympics. Let's talk about another big factor, and it's huge, <laughs> on why Golovkin, quite frankly, won't fall into the trap of the 2004 Olympics. And that's Golovkin's trainer, Abel Sanchez. Right? Understand, Sanchez was a big fan huge fan of Boxing Hall of Famer Julio Cesar Chavez. Sanchez has admitted in interviews that he made a decision to try to turn Golovkin into Julio Cesar Chavez. Right, folks? When you look at a Chavez film, you're going to notice that Chavez is doing a lot of what Golovkin does. Right? When you look at the 2004 Olympics, you're going to notice that Abel Sanchez isn't in Golovkin's corner. He's an addition later in his career. Now, just like Emmanuel Stewart retooled the career, of Adonis Stevenson, right? We always knew Stevenson could punch. You knew that looking at him as an amateur, right? But suddenly here is a puncher as a pro, and guess what? He's moving around. He's actually setting up that left hand, he's a southpaw, just like they do at the Kronk Gym, right? In fact, just like Emmanuel Stewart retool the career of Vladimir Klitschko, right? Compare and contrast. Klitschko, Corey Sanders, he's leaning over, he's there to throw punches, versus Klitschko today, right? Leaning back, here's a shock. He has an Emmanuel Stewart jab, right? Just like Adonis Stevenson, right? He's He has a construct, right? He's not there leaning forward, he's leaning back. Right? That's the same way Abel Sanchez has retooled Golovkin's game. So Sanchez has said, if Kell Brook tries to roughhouse us, my word, not his, right? But we all know it's 2004 Olympics. If Kell Brook tries to roughhouse us, it's going to be a short fight. Right? More than most, because of what happened in the 2004 Olympics, I'm just telling you Golovkin and his corner are aware of the fact that many people facing Golovkin think roughhousing and clinching is the way to beat him. I don't think it's going to work here. Right? I think Kell Brook gets stopped if he tries to roughhouse Golovkin Right? I think he's going to find that he can't clinch Golovkin. That where Sean Porter ran up to you so you could just clinch him. Golovkin is going to come not so close. And of course, whereas with Sean Porter, I could think to myself, okay, let me try to take one of his shots. 
with Golovkin, you don't have that option. Right? He hits too hard. Right? So, count me among the skeptics of the Cal Brook is going to treat Golovkin like he treated Sean Porter, school of thought. Right? I don't think Cal Brook will be able to even clinch Golovkin on a regular basis. Right? I think Golovkin, because in part of what happened in 2004, and because he has a great corner, I think Golovkin has figured out that he doesn't want to be clinched. Right? I think Golovkin's the kind of guy who, even with superior power, one of the hardest punchers in the sport, he's taken the time to add things like an above-average jab to his repertoire. Right? This is the slugger who's also a technician. The best chance Kell Brook has of winning this fight, I don't even think Kell Brook could win the fight by decision. The best chance Kell Brook has of winning the fight, quite frankly, is by waiting for Golovkin to swing and miss, to leave himself open, like he did against Daniel Gill and then to come in with a short straight punch that closes the show. Right? Golovkin does leave himself open. He does open uh, he does overcommit on punches from time to time. Right? Calbrook's only shot is a home run punch when Golovkin leaves himself open. I don't believe he can methodically outbox Golovkin. I don't believe he can roughhouse Golovkin. <clears throat> Let me hear from the boxing hardcore on that. If you're a Kell Brook person, if you're one of these people buying all these stories about Kell Brook bringing in experts and, you know, expert nutrition, and if you're one of these people who believe that Kell Brook, who has no body fat on him, right, he's not Chavez looking, you know, a little soft, Chavez Jr., Right, who could lose 20 pounds, if you believe that Kell Brook's sculpted physique is going to easily lose the 16 pounds in 30 days, and that Kell Brook's going to be the faster fighter, and Kell Brook will have his choice of strategy on fight night, then I hope you leave those comments in the comment section to this video. Right now, here at the 28-minute mark, let's segue into fantasy football, just a strategy on trying to get an edge on FanDuel. Let me point out that FanDuel is the deep end of the water. You have a lot of savvy people on FanDuel. If you visit FanDuel every day, you're going to see a lot of the same names, right? People are paying their bills using FanDuel, right? Understand you can make money on FanDuel. You can make a lot of money on FanDuel betting one or two games, right? Or rather, playing in one or two games. The odds are that high, right? People are, you know, literally putting up bounties. You're playing against other fans. It's not really a, uh, you know, house that you're playing against. But understand, people have events on the site that are worth thousands of dollars. So, with regard to FanDuel, I believe to get an edge, you need to be knowledgeable. And I don't mean a casual fan's knowledge base. I don't mean the guy at your fantasy pool who shows up with Fantasy Football Index who has a listing of the players courtesy of, you know, CBSSports.com or what have you, who thinks he's going to be balling, right? That's first grade stuff. Everyone at a fantasy pool has a ranking of the players, don't they? No, you need to be a little bit more knowledgeable, and the knowledge has to be real-time knowledge. 
So I personally believe that before you participate in these online fantasy pools, I believe you need to make sure that you have a modern phone that allows you to download apps. Right? Don't rely on ESPN.com. What I want you to do is to think about Bleacher Report's app. I want you to think about Score's app. I want you to think about CBS's sports app. Because you need information in real time. Right? You need to be the person who, by the time you log on to FanDuel, you already know that Teddy Bridgewater is out for the year. Right? By the time you log on to FanDuel, you need to already know not just that Levy and Bell suspended for three games. But you need to know that his backup is D'Angelo Williams and he's healthy. Right? You need to know these things. I believe that that requires a commitment every day of, I would say, at least half an hour. Just cycling through the top stories on these sports apps and focusing on specific players who you feel are undervalued, right? Everyone knows the overvalued players, right? Trust me, I was at a pool, and by overvalued, I'm not saying the guy doesn't have talent, but let's just say we already know the guys who people are going to pay top dollar for. So I'm at a pool, and oh, here's a shot. Pittsburgh wide receiver Antonio Brown went early. Oh, Cam Newton. Went relatively early, right? People, obviously, in a FanDuel context, are going to pay an arm and a leg for players like that. You need to be savvier. You can't pay half of your payroll for the obvious superstar. You need to do some homework, and you need to realize that Kirk Cousins, passing-wise, put up numbers comparable to Cam Newton last year. Might actually save you a bunch of money. Especially when you figure out that his supporting cast with the Washington Redskins, guys like, you know, Deshaun and Pierre, um, that he has some ballers up there who might give him more to work with than Cam has with Carolina. Right? So my first rule is if you're going to get involved in this, understand it's a deeper commitment than just hopping online and making picks. No, you need to view it as a half an hour a day. Surfing the net, finding stories, reading your sports apps, figuring out the backups you're going to jump to. If the starters get hurt, right? Focusing on the situations that the players are in as much as the players. So my first rule here on beating FanDuel is to be knowledgeable. My second rule is really to get help or be aware of the help that exists, right? Let the novices... Let the novices fool around. By the way, that offer I gave earlier applies to new accounts, right? It applies to new accounts. Let the novices fool around with, um, you know, trying to pick winners, right? What you need to do is to also consult with folks who aren't novices, so there are services online that actually give you suggested lineups on FanDuel with actual prices of players, right? Think about it. So RotoWire has something called FanDuel's Daily Lineup Optimizer. 
and it's free. Just Google Rotowire FanDuel Daily Lineup Optimizer. It'll pop up. In my opinion, whether you agree with Rotowire or not, at least give them a look before you put in your lineup. Right? At least get a second opinion. At least see what deals they've spotted in terms of player values. For the more hardcore, Sportsline.com charges $10 a month for their picks. Right? They have an excellent schedule on FanDuel. If you're on FanDuel and you're betting meaningful money and as I've said when you visit the site you're gonna realize that you can actually put up meaningful money then in my opinion the ten dollar investment in sportsline.com for information and suggested lineups is well worth it right I would encourage you to give sportsline.com a look it's actually good too for straight up suggested plays right you know next my next tip here on FanDuel.com is that you know the site you need to explore the site right your first day on FanDuel in my opinion you shouldn't bet your first day, you should really just be on the site exploring the site. Because what you'll find out is they have many different options. Right? You need to be aware of the lay of the land before you travel it. So, you hop on FanDuel. You see head-to-head -head competition. Right? Right? Before you engage in any head-to-head -head competition, do yourself a favor. Look up the person you're about to play. Find out how many games he's playing on FanDuel. Right? If you're up against a guy who's playing 10 games on FanDuel, 10 head-to-head -head matchups. Then you'll know you're in the deep end of the water. Right? That might not be the opponent to pick. Especially if the guy's a high-stakes player. Right? Figure out, too, FanDuel has a lot of these tournaments. Now, my favorite way to play FanDuel is head-to-head. -head. Right? Uh, but FanDuel has a lot of tournaments. In my opinion, you want to have at least a 50% chance of winning any tournament you're in. So FanDuel has top 50% <coughs> winners tournaments where they say, hey, everyone get in, the top 50% will win. Great. Before you enter any tournament on FanDuel, Figure out what percentage is going to win. Right? I know they're going to tempt you with provocative offers where they say, hey, you know, if you're one of the winners, you'll get paid out at this huge percentage. Okay, great. They're going to tempt you. Your focus should be on winning. Not on return early on right you need to figure out if you're good at it because if you're not good at it you shouldn't be in there doing the pie in the sky tournaments so if I were you I would focus on the tournaments that give you a 50% chance of winning the head-to-heads where it's either you or your opponent who's gonna win or the top 50% tournaments Right. Anyway, that's how I see it. Again, the promo code is Dwyer777, right? D-W-Y-E-R-777. You'll get a deep discount, right? It applies to new accounts. 
I hope it works out for you. If you're a FanDuel fantasy sports person and you want to offer your own set of tips, whatever stories you have, I hope you do so in the comment section to this video. Thanks for stopping by.